Hi, I'm Richard Sever from Cold Spring Harbour Lab. With me I have Joan Bruggi, Director of the Ludwig Centre at Harvard Medical School. Joan, welcome to Cold Spring Harbour. Thank you, it's great to be here. Um, welcome back, I should say, because you um, revealed earlier that the first <laughs> time you came here was 1974. So that actually wasn't for a meeting, it was to learn how to do a procedure that was very um, novel at the time, and it, Cold Spring Harbor was only one of the only places where they oh, did right. that, so it was cot analysis, hybridization <laughs> analysis with Joe Sandbrook, and oh, so I wow. spent a week at the lab and um, learned how to do it. So when was your first meeting here then? First meeting was Probably the RNA tumor virus meeting when I moved here in '79. So oh, okay. Shortly after that, I went. I moved to Stony Brook. Um, right, for right. My first position. Well, um, it's interesting you mentioned those early meetings because I, one of the <clears throat> one of the things that I think so interesting about your career and what, what I wanted to ask you about um, is your is your sort of general perspective because you've worked on so many things from the original identification of SARC. EGF receptor signaling, integrins, metabolism, yeah. you know, the microenvironment, uh, apoptosis, that seems you've covered so many things. And um, a, an old friend told me that um, this, this kind of like broad capacity meant that at one point you were appointed as the commissioner of the Oncogene Olympics <laughs> at a meeting. <laughs> Is that true? That, that involved my expertise outside of science. That's right. For sure. <laughs> In refereeing, was it? Apparently there was <laughs> team cytoplasm and team nucleus. Is yes, that right? exactly. Well, you know, the meeting was so intense that I thought it would be great to have a break and we, we had this short break um, in the afternoons but everybody roamed around they didn't know what to do so I thought uh -huh. maybe something where we could bond and at the same time have a lot of fun would be to have an Olympics so we had many different events um, you know soccer, softball, tennis and we broke up into the teams that were either for people that worked on the nucle nucleus or on the cytoplasm and and it became a tradition. Everyone enjoyed oh, really? it so much. So it was, it was lots of fun. So presumably you were in Team Cytoplasm. Yes, I would yes, definitely. I, would I stayed away from the nucleus for many years. <laughs> and, and, you know, and judging from um, the work you were talking about this morning, you remain very much in the cytoplasm. Um, you, you were telling us about high-grade ovarian cancer. So can you just sort of briefly say why that's such an important cancer to look at and what the challenges are? Right, so high-grade um, serous, it's called high-grade serous ovarian cancer, is one of the most recalcitrant um, types of cancer. The one problem is that the disease isn't detected until generally it's at stage three and four, and mm -hmm. the prognosis for patients that have stage three or four cancer is, is poor. Their five-year survival is somewhere around 10 or 20 percent. And um, basically the treatments haven't changed for the last 20 years. The treatment is generally chemotherapy, and patients go through a cycle of um, remission, relapse, remission, re relapse, and over and over. And treatment, this is would... generally the first line treatment is is a combination of platinum and a taxane. Uh huh. And then they eventually be the, all the tumor cells become resistant, and then they they basically throw every type of chemotherapy they can right. uh, at right. the tumors, and and generally, you know, eventually the tumors are resistant. And, and then there's nothing you can yeah. do. Yeah. So, um, it, you know, I, I, you know, it's almost like you showed a kind of what has sequencing done for us um, yeah. slide. So the DNA sequencing of tumors from TCGA seemed like there was a lot of information that you learned from, from those. What were the things that that, 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 that picked up? Right, so um, the sequence didn't reveal any smoking gun that oh. was obvious that we could go after right away. Um, you know, like there weren't mutations in EGFR or RAS, well, RAS can't go after right away either, um, EGFR or ALK <clears throat> or, or any of the other BRAF, any of the other um, oncogenes that have uh -huh. drugs that are directed against them. But it did reveal some interesting things. One is that almost every single tumor had a mutation in the tumor suppressor P53, and it looks uh -huh. like that's the first event. So that seems to trigger the initiation of the cancer. Mm -hmm. But then after that, I mean, in addition to that, there weren't any other mutations that were found at high frequency, but there were enormous number of copy number alterations. Right. Um, so through the 
um, investigators that worked on the sequencing information were able to discern a few pathways that looked interesting for therapeutic mm -hmm. intervention. And one is the, um, there are about 50% of the tumors had defects in some component of homologous recombination, mm -hmm. um, mediated repair of DNA damage. And so the PARP inhibitors are, are those tumors are more sensitive to, or predicted to be sensitive to PARP inhibitors, and PARP inhibitors are actually in the clinic for um, patients that have tumors that are defective in DNA repair. And right. That you know, there's initial success, but same kind of story as with the chemo, they re regret, they undergo remission and then relapse. It so, comes back. Basically. Yes. So they're trying yeah. to figure out what to do about that. Uh -huh. But then there was another. Um, they all, they also noticed that. Uh, there were common alterations in multiple components of two other pathways, mm -hmm. and that's the PI3 kinase, AKT, mTOR pathway, and the um, ERK pathway, the RAS ERK pathway. And about 50% of the tumors had a amplification or deletion in regulators of those pathways. Uh -huh. But then if you looked at single copy deletion or amplification, there, it, there was a huge percentage of tumors. And it raised the question whether, you know, slight amplification of an oncogene coupled with slight uh, or one copy loss of a negative regulator of that pathway would be sufficient to activate right. the pathway. So essentially sort of PI3K, AKT, or uh, pathway signatures were, were what you were seeing of well, this well, tumor. Yes, in terms uh. of the alterations, but then, um, accompanying the genetic information, the genome information on the, for the TCGA study, they also recently published uh, proteomics um, data mm -hmm. using the RPPA platform that Gordon Mills has, has right. um, developed at MD Anderson. And that showed, that provided strong support that both of these pathways are activated because the markers of of the phosphoproteins that are indicative of the pathway being activated were enriched in about, looked like, you know, somewhere around 70, 75% mm -hmm. of the tumors. So that's what made us feel that it would be worth exploring these two pathways yeah. um, to see if there would be any therapeutic potential. Yeah, and so you, it being those two pathways in particular, you, you must have thought, aha, uh -huh, I know yeah, about those. I know those. something about <laughs> those, yes, exactly. Um, and, 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 and you talked about a computational approach to, to working out what was going on. So what was the next stage in, in looking at the consequences of activation of, of I guess, the, the PI3K path, pathway first of all? Yeah, so what we found was that there was about 10 to 15 fold variation in mm -hmm. the sensitivity of the... Um, patient-derived xenografts that we looked at. Mm -hmm. One thing that we decided to do was to use um, samples from tumor cell samples from patient-derived xenografts, and these right. had been developed at the Dana Farmer. So you're Dana growing Farmer. these in mice? So they grow in mice, mm -hmm. we harvest them, and then we, we have a pipeline for analysis such that, so that we can ensure that we, we get as reproducible data as possible. Right. So um, they're, they're cultured exactly the same way for this exact number of days, and then- um, And then being, um, PDX mice more, more representative of what was going on originally. Yes, exactly. These match the representation of genomic alterations and pathway mm -hmm. activation very nicely um, right. relative to the human tumor data. Uh -huh. itself. So we found this 10 to 15 fold variation in PI3 kinase, um, uh, sen our sensitivity to PI3 kinase mTOR inhibitors. However, the, what we found was that these inhibition of these pathways caused a cessation of proliferation but didn't induce cell death. Right. And so we wanted to understand that. And we previously had data suggesting that there was an adaptive response, like a rewiring of pathways mm -hmm. as, as in order for the cells to adapt to inhibition of this central pathway that regulates cell survival. You know, we, right. we originally you, we would have expected there to be a uh, induction of death, but what we found is there's this massive upregulation of signaling pathways that um, provide survival protection. So right. anti-apoptotic pathways were were, in, were in activated significantly, like the right. BCL2 protein. Right. Um, so you saw both pro-apoptotic yeah, so, and anti-apoptotic. Right. So going when we we had seen this initial activation of BCL2 originally, but the new analysis that 
that um, Gordon Mills has mm -hmm. in, <clears throat> includes 12 different pro and antipeptotic proteins. And what we found is that they were both upregulated. And so right. it wasn't just a survival response. There was also a, you know, there was also <clears throat> a response to inhibition of this uh -huh. survival pathway, which basically led to a new balance. So uh -huh. upregulation, pro-apoptotic, but at the same time, adaptive response to counter that. And so the cells had reached a new equilibrium with higher levels of the pro-apoptotic proteins as well as the anti-apoptotic proteins. Right, right. So that suggested that the cells may be primed for um, um, inhibition of the anti-apoptotic proteins, or primed such, let's see, go backwards. Um, it suggested that if we could inhibit the anti-apoptotic proteins, this would unleash the elevated activity of the pro-apoptotic right. proteins to induce cell death. So it's almost like the cells basically have one foot on the gas and one on the brake, and if Precisely. you could kick the foot off the brake, yes. then you'd be okay. That's perfect. Yeah. Right, oh, okay. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's, that's and, and that's what we found, that um, when we combined a um, BCL2XL combined inhibitor from AbbVie together mm. with the PI3 kinase mTOR inhibitor, uh, all but just a few of the models, we got really nice synergistic death. Right, okay. Um, but what's interesting is that there were three models that were much less sensitive and we didn't see synergy with the BCL2 XL inhibitor. Mm -hmm. And so we, um, Giannis Zerbatnakis, who's an uh, engineer who's in our lab, did kind of a systems level analysis using yeah. um, uh, a regression analysis. And he was able to make predictions about which components of these pro and anti proteins would best predict the response to the PI3 kinase right. um, combined oh, inhibition. And it just worked out beautifully. Um, the predictions made from this analysis were um, validated completely with mm -hmm. the inhibition studies and um, with the proteomic studies. So those three um, PDX models that were the least sensitive had, it was predicted that another anti or two other anti-apoptotic proteins called MCL1 and XIP were elevated and they were uh -huh. predicted to correlate with the resistance. And if we inhibited either one of those, we got a very dramatic inhibition of survival. So it really in those was models. a targeted therapy. Yeah, yeah. So basically we were able to, and then we also were able to parse out, <clears throat> the original inhibitor we used was BCL2XL um, combined inhibitor. Mm -hmm. and the uh, regression analysis indicated that XL was much more predictive. And okay. so we, we got inhibitors from AbbVie against the XL and the separately, the BCL, the BCL two team. specific right. ones, and we found exactly that, that the it was all about the, the BCL XL inhibitor was really um, com, uh, efficient or it was it had great efficacy in combining with the PI3 kinase inhibitors and BCL2 inhibitors basically didn't have any activity. Mm -hmm. So we were able to parse out which of the different components of the anti-apoptotic um, uh, program are critical in different models. In, in each case. And it, you know, it looks like they will be good biomarkers for um, down the road potentially if for what if to it give goes whom. in the clinic. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And what was and what and, and that was on the AKT side and you talked about the uh, this other pathway yeah. the the uh, MAP kinase pathway, what, what was the results there? Were, were you getting a similar upregulation um, of these apoptosis regulators? Yes, definitely. Um, so so the, for the ERK pathway, ERK pathway had previously been shown to suppress expression of a very dominant, potent pro-apeptotic protein called mm. BIM. And what we noted um, when we looked at the RPPA data is that there was there were three different groups of the uh, PDX models. Uh -huh. One where ERK was high and BIM was low, which you'd predict, mm -hmm. and one where ERK was low and BIM, BIM. was high. Oh, okay. And then we had two that were just kind of low for both. And so we, 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 we suspected that inhibition of ERK in the models in which uh, the ERK which that were all re weren't already high for BIM, that we could potentially upregulate BIM and sensitize the cells. Right. And that's exactly what happened. Um, all those models that had either 
uh, medium BIM or high BIM, but okay, those models in which inhibition of ERK led to an increase in BIM were very sensitive to the combination of BCL2, XL, and um, um, ERK in, or MEC inhibition. But the other ones were not, and it turns out those. MEC being the protein upstream of. Yes, ERK sorry, this, right, right, yeah. So right. ERK will block the. I mean, sorry, right. MEC inhibitor will block the ERK Both pathway. Ergs, right. Um, okay, so, and it turns out that those that where we didn't see any synergy, again, were the ones that had high MCL1, and when right. we used the MCL1 inhibitor combined with the MEC inhibitor, we got beautiful synergy. So, um, basically, it. <clears throat> It turns out that the same PDX models that were sensitive to PI3 kinase were sensitive to ERK. Mm -hmm. um, and those, what we, what we found out is that PI3 kinase inhibitor was inhibiting ERK. And so essentially, uh, we saw the same activity because the PI3 kinase was upstream of the ERK, and when we inhibited PI3 kinase, we inhibited ERK uh, as, as well. well. Right. And so we're, we were talking to AbbVie and Genentech Mm -hmm. um, about the you know, clinical translation of this. They're most interested in a MEC inhibitor, BCL2, XL combination. Right. Because MEC inhibitors have less overall toxicity and they think it would be easier to combine it with the right. BCL2, XL inhibitor. So, you know, we're setting up to do the preclinical studies now to focus on, on that combination. What's interesting, I mean, so Bill Kalin made the point last night that he, he drew an analogy to um, the early days of the AIDS epidemic and com right. contrasting the 1980s and you know what what that meant with now um, triple cocktail th therapy we have for HIV um, and it struck me that I mean you would there's a triple cocktail in there that you're talking about more it's more tailored patient to patient do you do you think that we're potentially at an inflection point where this is equivalent to the triple cocktail moment with HIV I think that that's what we're likely going to have to work towards. Uh -huh. um, it's not straightforward because of the complications in, of, in clinical trials. Mm -hmm. Generally, you can just add one at a time, and so the you have to do layered um, trials to look at the addition of a uh, second drug to the and first to the one, and then and then yet another one. Um, so it's not going to be straightforward, but I I, I think unless uh, immunotherapy can clean up all of those resistant tumor cells mm -hmm. from the you know initial therapies, say either one or two, that we're going to have to be we're going to have to get better killing, which is going to involve more inhibitors. Right. I mean, I think it's we're hopeful that the immune system will do that. Right. And then you know those are orthogonal therapies, and so it might be more straightforward. Yeah. Than, you know to yet another signaling pathway yeah, or something. Yeah. Well, it certainly, it certainly sounds um, like there's a reason for optimism. Yes, and, definitely. Um, and, and good luck with it. It's been great talking to you, Joan. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.